Welcome to Bremtech. Today we will clean up this old empty 412 cabinet and install some speakers. Stick around to see how to clean super dirty Tolex and wire 412 inch speakers. Well, this is the cabinet. It was a PV model 412 MS from the late 80s. I couldn't find too much information about it, but I found this old catalog page. The 412M was the bottom cabinet, and the MS was the top slanted cabinet. The S stands for slanted. The catalog said this was designed and maximized for the serious rocker. I'm thinking they had me in mind back then. Now getting back to my cabinet, I got this for a good deal, but there were no speakers, and it was super dirty. I mean, look at this Tolex. It's nuts. And the dirt is collected all the way down in the Tolex craters. Let's take a look at the sides of the cabinet. The evidence supports that some serious rocker spilled a drink or two on here. These cab corners, well, they're chipped and rusty. Don't forget about the nicks in the Tolex. And the grill. It's dusty. And I'm hoping that's just dust. We're going to fix all these issues, but let's start with the Tolex and maybe fix those nicks first. Here's a typical nick caused by dinging the cabinet against the doorway, a car trunk, or bandmate. By using a pin taped to a pencil, you can see that the Tolex is still there, it's just pulled back. Here I'm applying some CA glue to the wood and Tolex. Now bring back that pin pen pineapple pencil to push the Tolex down to the wood. Then when that doesn't work, use the eraser end, just like you should have in the first place. Now you could hold this down until the glue dries, but I'll spray on some activator to make the adhesive cure more quickly. I really want to get my money's worth out of that pin for some reason. This is the back panel of the cabinet, and you can see where some Tolex had ripped off. It's possible to see the wood when the back cover is installed, so I'll just color this in with a Sharpie. Any missing Tolex can be made less obvious by coloring in the wood with a Sharpie. And if your goal is to make your cabinet or amp look less terrible, this is an acceptable method. Let's move on to talking about cleaning dirty Tolex. I wasn't expecting such a formidable adversary. I won't bore you with minutes of scrubbing video, so I'll get right to the point. I'm using just water and a scrubbing brush here. Certainly that would work, right? Let's check out how it did once the water dried up. It's literally like I didn't do anything. So at this point, I was a little miffed and I didn't really have a plan B. I rummaged around the kitchen and grabbed some Windex to see how that fared. Oh, and, and by the way, your Windex bottle will spray much better if you have more than a few millimeters in there. Now I'm scrubbing the cabinet again, but this time with the Windex. I'm happy to report that the Tolex looks much better and the dirt is removed from the crevices. But I am not done yet. I use these Armor All wipes on my car's dashboard. And in my brain, Tolex and the covering on my dash look relatively similar. So it makes sense to me to use Armor All on the Tolex. I just wipe these on as you would expect. I imagine it would be much easier to use the spray bottle Armor All uh, but this is what I had on hand. Because I'm a nice guy, I decided to do a side-by-side -side comparison on one of the sides of the cabinet. Up top you have the original condition with the dirty craters. The bottom right shows the Tolex after the Windex application. And the bottom left has the Armor All applied. Now whether or not these products were intended for Tolex, you can't argue with how it looks after the Armor All. I'm not sure how to even describe the dramatic color change. It's like, how much more black could this be? And the answer is none, none is that good? more black. Like the Tolex, the grill cloth was also pretty dirty. You can clearly see some liquid spillage that has occurred in the past, but maybe not so clear in this video is that a lot of dust is coming off with just brushing. On this freeze frame, check out the color difference between the brushed and unbrushed area you can see how much dust has been removed by brushing. Now once I got most of the dust off, I went back with water and tried to remove those liquid stains. Although it didn't work 100%, it's much better now. When I got the cabinet, the back panel was only held on with two screws. But look what I found inside. It's the other screws, all wrapped up nice and neat in a little baggie. 
Here you can see that the speakers mount to the rear of the baffle and are held on with threaded studs and nuts. You might also be wondering what this long piece of wood in the middle is. This wooden brace presses against the back panel of the cabinet so that it doesn't vibrate like a drum head. Kind of like how a bell stops ringing if you touch it. Speaking of back panels, does anybody know what band this is? It's something spirit. I can't make the first word out. Oh boy. One Celestian box. Two Celestian boxes. Three Celestian boxes. And four. Oh, wait a minute. Aw oh, man. These are PV VK12s. It turns out I happen to know a guy that replaced his PV speakers with Celestians. So I got a hold of these for a reasonable price. Hey look, they look brand new. If they sound half as good as they look, then we'll be in business. Either way, speakers sound better than no speakers. Am I right? Before we install these speakers, let's take a moment to talk about this episode's sponsor, Socks. Mittens for your feet. As you can see, I only wear the highest quality name brand socks. If you're able to correctly pronounce this brand of socks out loud in the comments, you are a better person than I. Where did you get those clothes? At the toilet store? So even though these are PV speakers going into a PV cabinet and the mounting holes are elongated, the mounting studs just barely line up with the holes and it requires a little bit of fiddling to get the speaker to mount flush. Here's another view. Notice I'm intentionally orienting the speaker terminals toward the center of the cabinet so that my wiring harness doesn't have to be unreasonably long. Once the speaker is in, it's time to install the nuts. They just thread right onto the studs. Trust me, this part is easy. A nut driver makes quick work of tightening the speaker down. And that'll do it for the speaker installation. Ohm MG. What did the previous owner do here? Well, he certainly didn't do me any favors by cutting off the wiring harness. These are just two standard mono quarter inch jacks, the type you'll find on most speaker cabinets. Redoing the wiring here will be fairly straightforward. Luckily, there is a little bit of wire lead left, even though it barely reaches the other jack. My plan is to solder these wires to the lower part of the terminal, and by leaving the top part of the terminal open, I'll still be able to slide on one of those blade style disconnects. A keen observer will notice I'm making a mistake here. I am soldering the tip terminal of one jack to the ring terminal of the other. I didn't notice this until editing this video. I will go back and swap the positions of the wire on the jack on the left. The only problem that this would cause is an out of phase signal between two connected speaker cabinets. Here you can see how the blade style disconnect will connect the wiring harness to the input jack. To make the wiring harness, I took some primary wire, twisted the ends together, and crimped on a blade style disconnect. While that's all fine and dandy, you might be wondering how the wiring harness is made to ensure that the speakers are connected together correctly. Each of the replacement speakers has 16 ohms of impedance, and the four speaker cabinet needs to also have a 16 ohm impedance. This can be achieved by connecting the speakers in a series parallel or parallel series configuration. When connecting equal impedance speakers in series, the total impedance doubles. And when connected in parallel, the total impedance is cut in half. So a series parallel circuit would double the total impedance to 32 ohms, then have it back to 16 ohms for the entire cabinet. In addition, if all speakers were connected in series, the resulting impedance would be 64 ohms. That's 16 ohms per speaker multiplied by four speakers. Conversely, if all speakers were connected in parallel, the resulting impedance would be four ohms, 16 ohms divided by four speakers. Now I'm installing my lovely wiring harness by following the schematic I just showed. Since I color coded the wiring harness, it's easy to make sure that the wires are connected to the correct terminals on the speakers. And as planned, the wiring harness just plugs right onto the exposed terminals of the jacks. It might be a good idea to test your wiring job with a multimeter at this point, but I like to play it dangerously, so I'll check it after the back panel is on. The back panel is just held on with a bunch of screws around the perimeter. If you think I'm putting the back panel on upside down, I am and I'm not. 
I did intend to do this so that the input jack is closer to the top of the cabinet so you don't have to reach so far down when plugging in your amp head. Now I'm checking the impedance of the cabinet to make sure it's wired correctly. If you remember, we expect 16 ohms and some measurement value around there would be fine. And now it's time to put on the logo. This isn't the original logo for this particular cabinet, but this logo came from the same guy that I got the speakers from. Apparently it's not cool to be seen with PV equipment. I really just eyeballed the center of the cabinet and screwed it in. And it looks okay. Hey, hey, that, uh, that doesn't look too bad now after a good cleaning. I suppose the only thing left to do is see how it sounds. Now this wouldn't be a good video if I didn't use a PV amp to test this PV cabinet out. Let's see what I have kicking around for PV amps. Yep, I think this will do nicely. This is a Bandit 112 and it's sort of a basket case at the moment, taken apart and left for dead. Hooking up these basket case amps, uh, it's a little tricky, so I'll go through it with you. First, plug in one side of the speaker cord to the speaker cabinet. Then connect the other side of the speaker cord to the cutoff speaker leads of the combo amp. Next, connect the effects send to the effects return with a patch cord if you actually want the audio signal to bypass the internally corroded connections. Don't forget to attach the power cord to the amp. Then plug it into the wall. Get out your favorite axe, plug that in, and you're ready to jam. Well, thanks for watching. I'm just kidding. That's a lot to bite off and shoot. <laughs> hey guys, thanks for watching. Now don't forget to tune in next time where we will be taking that sad looking bandit combo and converting it to a mean looking head. <laughs>